Howdy everybody in YouTube land. What we have here today on the bench to work on is a Pioneer SX750. So the story behind this one is this unit doesn't belong to me. It belongs to someone else. Um, I did a video a while back on the SX780 and I sold that stereo system to another person and that same person owns this one and this one came from the Boiling Springs South Carolina TV place that we went to and he got a deal on this one but this one has some problems and we'll get into that shortly um, so I sold the 780 and that one died it needs some parts um, which is no surprise I mean those things have to be completely gone through inside and out and that's the reason why I'm making this video um, on this one is because I'm gonna go through this one. So That one I sold it off because I replaced it with the SA 8800 and I didn't need the AM FM tuner anymore and the AM FM tuner is basically useless to me because I don't listen to the radio anymore and I'm noticing at least in my area. It's a generational divide. So What you hear on the radio is either modern stuff that today's youth listen to and you have stuff from the 70s and 80s that the previous generation behind me listens to but there's kind of a gap in the middle of programming that is just not on there there's i'm i'm more of the 90s r&b hip-hop dance you know electronic music not some 2000 stuff but it just doesn't play on the radio anymore it just doesn't there's this gap and uh, you know or there's sports talk programming or there's Christian and other religion programming, stuff like that. It's just, it's just not like a petite. So there's no point in even having the radio anymore. I do occasionally listen to some classic stuff from the eighties, seventies and eighties. And I have that tuned in on my car, but that's it. The, my, my primary decades, the decade that I grew up in and it's just not being aired on the radio anymore. It's very rare. I think maybe in some select areas it's, it might be, slowly starting to come in um i don't know I, I don't live i live in the the trifecta the asheville greenville spartanburg and atlanta area and the stations that i can actually receive here because i'm kind of stuck in the middle between those three in the mountains and there's just it just doesn't come in hardly so anyways there's no point to it um i digress so this receiver here um after the 780 died he tried to use this one and this one turns on the um, protection relay will engage come on and then after a second or two it clicks off and we're going to see why in a minute so before i even plugged it in we had to clean it up a little bit and it's it's still a mess there's some stuff in it, it just it's notice the uh silver face brushed aluminum has kind of a brown tinge to it that's not natural it's it's got it's covered in it's just caked in cigarette spooge and whatever else it's just nasty so it needs cleaned but um anyways let's take the top off of it so we can get a good look inside that's what we have on the inside don't mind this this is the screws that i took out and i brought it because i took this apart at work to have a quick look at it um and then ended up bringing it home here to work on so First thing I did was I checked the output transistors and they were good before I powered it up. Uh, we blew out all the dust with the air compressor and let it dry. And I mean, this thing's been sitting so long, there was mold on the top of the transformer. But you can tell by looking at the light bulbs, this thing's got some hours on it. This thing has seen some use. And it's seen some heat too because you can see shrinkage of the capacitors. Uh, so this thing does turn on but it's got a problem and it's a problem with all of these uh, eventually anyways if not now it will be so let's make sure the power is off we're going to plug this in so we are plugged in now we're going to grab our meter which i just have stashed out of the way over there so i'm going to put it in dc volts mode and then what we're going to do 
is we're going to monitor the speaker output in DC volts mode. And it's kind of a mess back here. You can tell it's seen some... I'm wondering if this was a shop radio or something. But yeah, I'm going to get the probes in here. But I need both hands to do it. Alright, so probes are in there. Let's turn the power on. See what's happening here? Boom. See how the DC offset just kind of bounced around and slowly got worse and worse and worse? That's common with these. Well, some of these anyways. So, there's a combination of things happening here with these old receivers. And one, it could be a noisy transistor or other semiconductor that's in these um, driver boards. Or even the power supply board can, you know, do stuff like that. The other thing that can happen is... The capacitors themselves, there's probably specific ones going bad. Like, for example, this one here that has the shrunken heat shrink on it. This this outer stuff is means it's seen some heat, and it's got to be replaced. So, there's a couple approaches to this, and I've shown, I know at least one side of it, and that's, you know, troubleshooting it and saying, well, let's replace the one capacitor, and or the one or two transistors, and let's hope that you know it, it holds up and i kind of did that with the previous the sa8800 i did fully recap that one but i only replaced a couple of a select few of the semiconductors and so far it's okay but how long will it be before it starts doing what this one's doing when the transistor in the driver board starts to fail you know so i'm going to do something a little different for this video and since this thing is probably going to get daily use anyways, or close to it, I decided to say, hey, it should be a good idea to fully restore this thing. And that means changing all of the capacitors, changing the known semiconductors that have caused problems based on stuff like that. So, so there's two ways of going about doing that. You can look up the service manual. You can find the transistors that these guys use. And see if you can cross-reference them, because I guarantee that transistors for those are no longer going to be available. Um, so, you could do all of that footwork, or you can go online and see if that footwork has been done for you by other technicians. So, I took a gamble. What we did is we went on that crazy place there, and we bought... A rebuild kit so that will make life a lot easier instead of going through the hassle of looking up all the components cross-referencing figuring out which ones to get and all that fun stuff so the problem with this is though is it's a double-edged sword because now you're relying on someone else's uh, aptitude and abilities and research and all of that stuff that has done said things so you got to be careful with that um however i feel confident because the seller that sold this stuff has sold a ton of these and seems to have pretty good reviews so i think since he done all the footwork or maybe the public has and he took the information and run with it to put together a a nice uh, kit, you know, it, it's not indifferent of what I've done it, uh, you know, with other stuff like console5.com where I've ordered rebuild and capacitor kits from them. Um, and I, I've not had a problem yet, but if you're OCD like me sometimes and you're trying to match exact lead height, spacing, um, capacitor height, diameter, stuff like that, then you're not going to be able to do anything like that. But if you don't really care as much, like in this case, uh, you can just get away with a kit. And that's what I did here. So, I'm just going to go off the um, Made in the European Union. So, yeah, I'm just going to go off the hope, prayer, and guarantee that this guy knows what he's doing. And he followed either community guidelines or he used his own technician and decided to sell a parts kit. So... That's what we're going to do with this. Will it fix the problem? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on which one's failed. But if I'm going to do any kind of assumptions, I'm going to assume that 
the what happens to these is known and these parts can or this kit contains parts to fix some of the known issues so what we're going to do now is just go off that hunch and hope for the best so let's see we have rebuild instructions thanks thank you for buying the kit this kit from me this will allow you to fully rebuild the correct replacement output transistors are mj21193 and mj21194c he's done the research so i don't have to go and look i have them listed on ebay do not buy any output transistors from china or any other transistors for that matter no shit in case you didn't know, yeah, China. There are tons of new Sankin outputs on eBay, but Sankin hasn't existed in 20 years, so it doesn't matter. Made in Japan or fake will blow up. Yeah, we know, but just in case you don't, there you go. Seriously, you need to use the correct parts, outputs. Nothing else will do. If you have bad outputs on one channel, replace all outputs on that channel. Yep, that's rule of thumb. Otherwise, you can have a mismatch. In order to rebuild this, you'll need a soldering iron wire cutters, Phillips screwdriver, needle nose pliers. I like to replace a few components, then test the equipment, then replace a few more, then test again. Yeah, the, I do agree with that. Um, and it, that can be seen in a few other videos like, you know, Bob Anderson or Shango 066 or some of the channels like that. Mr. Carlson's lab. You can, you can go stage by stage, board by board, and just see how things go. But since I can't really verify the operation of this receiver anyways, Plus, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and just change them all um, in one go, one board at a time. But for people that aren't as experienced, I recommend following what he says here. So this is a fairly complicated rebuild. If you have not worked on vintage stereo gear before, this may be too advanced for you. Absolutely true. Not a good thing to cut your teeth on. So, this is fairly complicated rebuild, blah, blah, blah. If you do not have a dim bulb tester, please build one and use this with a 60 watt or 100 watt incandescent bulb. I do agree with this. I don't know if I have any bulbs on hand. I think I do. I got to see, but I don't, you know. However, this receiver tries to run, so I'm not going to bother with that a whole lot, but that's bad advice for me, so follow this advice instead. Remove four screws holding on top cover. We'll start with the bottom. We'll start on the bottom power supply board, the one with fuses. Undo the screws. So this tells you step by step exactly what you have to do. Here's a little bit of info on the capacitors. The capacitors in this kit are almost all the exact same capacitance ratings as the originals, though many will go a bit higher on voltage. The new capacitors are much higher quality, but are smaller because of the advances in electronics design. Yeah, of course. In order to replace each capacitor, carefully desolder one capacitor and then pull up on the list. So that's a step-by-step -step instruction. Okay, so they didn't do double-sided printing. So, noting which side, which way it goes in. Each capacitor will have a line along this one side of the body that indicates the negative side. Some caps on the board are replaced with red and wyma film capacitors which have no polarity well actually technically they do and i think there's a mr carlson's lab video that it goes over this they do have a polarity but not like you would think so go see that video so you can put them in either way make sure you put in all the other new capacitors exactly the same orientation as the old ones the circuit board will have a little plus or minus sign to show you which way the capacitor goes always double check in the service manual but sometimes there are errors in the manual or on the pc board believe it or not Yep, I've run into this. So the easiest way to do this is just pull the cap out carefully and put the new one in exactly the same way. So that means just pull the capacitor out and note how it was inserted. And even to that front, sometimes they've installed them backwards from the factory. I've seen that before too. So yeah, um, right. Just use your best judgment here. Some of the larger caps are glued to the board. Yeah, that stupid circuit glue is going to have to go clean the old glue off before we put in the new capacitors new caps don't have to be glued don't leave water bits lying around they'll short stuff out and cause problems yeah you're not wrong there once everything is installed on the board solder it in trim the leads reinstall the board test on the receiver on the dim bulb if it works fine move on to the next step this is probably the board by board procedure now we'll do the top power supply protection board this is mounted vertically on the top. You'll need to remove the two screws. 
So you first replace the capacitors. Most of the caps on the board has been upgraded in voltage. You can pause to read this if you wish. There are two tiny blue, sky blue, 0.22. They're replaced with new small 0.22 UF red Wyma film capacitors. They're non-polar, so they can go in either way. Again, refer to my previous comment. There are a pair of big red caps in the kit Mark 225K. Those will be used for something else later. Once you have all the caps installed, solder them in, test the receiver. Uh, yeah, I don't... I'm not going to do that. That's a bad idea. Well, it's not a bad idea, but that's not what I'm, that's not how I'm going to do it. But in case you're not sure, follow the instructions. Replace the transistors. You will need to use a service manual to identify which transistor is which. So we're going to need a copy of the service manual, maybe. Q1 and Q4 are probably C945 or C869 transistors. These are all replaced with the new KSC1845. I've done this before in my SA8800 uh, video. Uh, which go in the same way as 945s, but the opposite way of the 869s. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I've been there. If you put any of the transistors in wrong, they will die and the receiver will not work. Shit will explode. Make sure you orient them correctly. That should be underlined. Yes. Absolutely. All transistors in this kit are ECB, which is emitter collector base, except the three with the metal backs, which are base collector emitter. Here's a diagram of how the transistors go in. All these transistors are MPN transistors, except for the A940, A1220, and A992, which is prefixed with 2SA. These days it's KSA, but whatever. Or MPSA, or MMBTA, or, you know, something like that. So... Let's move on to the next sheet. Okay. Feel free to pause at any time if you want to see these instructions. We will follow them the best we possibly can to not confuse the viewers. See, now you will use the circuit board markings to understand how these go in. Yep, typical Pioneer. After you replace Q1 to Q4, test the receiver on the dim bulb. Then look at Q5. It's usually a 2SA733 and does not need to be replaced. But you can replace it with the new A992 transistor. It goes in the same way as the 2SA733. If it's something other than a 2SA733, replace it with the KSA992 and use the board markings. Q6, Q9, Q11 all replaced with the 2SC or KSC2383 transistors will go in the same way. I love how he uses a lot of probabilities here. Maybe probably. Well, I guess there must be design revisions of this board. I mean, it's entirely possible, but I don't like seeing maybe probably's. Not when I'm doing something like this. So, anyways, slash rant. Q7 is usually a KSC 1384, but could be a KSC 1166, 1167. It is replaced with a new 2690. It has to be board revisions or production line changes that he was referring to. Replace a single B507D transistor with the A940, which goes in the same way. Heat sink compound on both sides of the insulating pad first. A little plastic washer fits on the other side of the transistor, and the whole screws go through, blah, blah, blah. So pause. Finally, replace the relay. Why do we need to replace the relay? Did they go bad? Hmm. All right. So, what's this page? Recapping this should not affect tuning. But what I like to do is replace a few caps, test the tuner on the dim bulb, then replace a few more, etc. This board has the muting board attached to it vertically in the middle. Okay, where is that? I don't see the muting board. Oh, yep, I do. It's right there. Ignore that one, we'll do it later. First, replace the caps, or a lot of these are replaced as red Wyma caps, which are non-polar, so they go in either way. Refer to previous comment earlier in the video. For the electrolytic caps, the three smaller 220 microfarad caps, 16 volt, 16 volt, 6.3 volt, are all replaced with 220 microfarad, 16 volt. Yeah, it makes sense, consolidate some voltage. Now we'll do the tone board. So it does the two power supply boards, and we do the tuner board, and we do the tone board. 
Vertical mounting board, we can do that now. Now it's time for the amp board. On the amp board, all electrolytic capacitors are replaced new ones. So our problem is in the amp board primarily. So let's take a focus on this one more, more importantly. This is my vertically attached heat sink with the output transistors. You should be able to get this out, but it will be a bit of a challenge. Yep, I didn't notice. Hmm, wire wrap fun. Two little blue bob USB. Let's see. You do not want to break the wires on these. They're almost impossible to replace. The barristers. Yeah, that's for bias control. You do not want to break the wires on these since they're almost impossible to replace. On the amplifier board, all the electrolytic capacitors are replaced with new ones. The two little blue blob one microfarad caps are replaced with Wyma film caps, which are nonpolar. The two trimmers are replaced with new Borns trimmers, which go in facing the same way as the old ones. You may bend the terminals a little bit to get them to fit. Q3-4 transistors are probably 2SC-1438s, but are replaced with the new KSC-2383 transistors, which should go in the same way, but use this, the board markings to be sure. There are two 2SA-798 dual transistors on this board. These act up over time and should be replaced. That's probably what we have going on here with the um, bias and offset just going nuts. So if we wanted to just get this thing working, we could probably replace those 2SA-798s and be all right. But you know the rest of it's going to be right behind it. These act up over time and should be replaced. Each 2SA-798 is replaced with a match pair of KSA-992 transistors. So, all right. You will notice that the KSA-992 for this. All right, next page. Board have board numbers written on the paper tape. You want each closest number pair to replace one K. So he's pretty thorough here. This is good. So you want each closest number pair to replace one 2SA-798. The boards have extra holes, so you can replace each 2SA-798 with a pair of KSA-992s without any difficulty. Just use board markings to install them properly. Once you're done here, test the receiver on the dim bulb. The main capacitors are very important to replace here. The old ones will be worn out and weak by now. They're fa these are fairly simple. Take a picture of how the wires attach. All right, we'll get to that. Man, this is 22 minutes long already. So let's let's do this. Let's get this. Wiggle each wire. Now you can set the amp board voltages. Use the service manual for this. You should use a plastic trimmer adjustment tool and a multimeter with mini grabber leads. Do not use regular probes. Do not use regular probes. Okay? Mini grabber leads will make it hard to mess up. Regular multimeter probes can slip and damage the amplifier module. You have to set the amp board voltages direct plug directly in the wall. Dim bulb will limit your current and voltage. Double check, make sure everything's if you have any. All right, this guy's from Audio Karma. That's a good site. Close your receiver up and enjoy. If you have any questions, contact me through eBay or you can post on audiokarma.org in the Pioneer Forum. They will be help, help, happy to help you out there. Audiokarma.org slash forums Pioneer Audio 90. I've been in there before. I love that forum. I've been on that forum probably since the very early 2000s. I have many other kits and parts available. To keep an eye on them. Okay. So, if you made it that far, then congratulations. You're not bored yet. Otherwise, I'm sure you probably skipped all the way over to this point. So, we have the parts kit here, and in the newspaper are the instructions that we need to follow. And we're going to follow them pretty closely i'm not since i'm experienced in this i'm not going to go at 100 percent. but if you're doing this for the first time and you're watching this video and you have one of these you're not entirely certain follow these directions these directions are well written there's a lot of probabilities and maybes in there which i have concerns with but that is most likely due to the cause of production changes as these were manufactured so that's okay so let's get that done we'll go through these instructions we'll do it in the order that they explained and we're just going to get her done. So we're going to do one board at a time, and I will pick up this video um, for each step. I'm not going to record me soldering and pulling out caps and putting caps in and all that stuff. That's just that's just going to make the video 500 hours long because this is probably going to take multiple days to, to get done. So, um, yeah, let's just for now do the 
the boards one at a time. And then if you remember from the first page, it wants us to start on the board at the bottom with the fuses. So let's do that. So the awesome thing is the, the person that put this kit together has organized them in all of the sections that you need. So we have the muting section here for the muting step. We have the amplifier section. We have the tone, the tone board, tone control board section. We have the tuner and we have the power supply. This must be the lower power supply, which was the one he suggested to start with first. So that's what we're gonna do. That just leaves this bag here, which is not really labeled. It will just says SX780 or 750, I keep saying, but there's nothing there. So if I were to hazard guess, with the relay inside there and all the other parts, that's probably that board there. So that should uh, help here. So I like the organization of how this is done. It makes it easier for a novice, not a beginner, but a novice to be able to work on this amplifier. So if you're a novice, definitely follow these instructions because they are well written. Um, I am going, it says to build, rebuild the board and test it, rebuild it, test it. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just do all the boards one at a time. I'm going to go with the directions, but I'm not going to test it after each step because I already know what's wrong with this receiver. Uh, no matter how many things I do in here is not going to affect the outcome of what's going on up here. So I would have, in order for that, I'd have to start with the amplifier first, but we're just going to go in the order of this and then we're going to test everything. So, and then here's the new capacitors for that. That's a quality brand, but it looks like it was made in 2006. Um, anyways, they've never been used, so they're probably okay, but they do age. They do have a shelf life. 409, 412, 372. Oh, dang. So he went into detail. So he literally tested the trains. Oh, okay. So this guy is very thorough. This person's very thorough. So that's, that's good. So he actually identified the beta or I think that would be the beta. It's the old school trans conductance uh, of each transistor on its own. This reminds me of the X-Ray Tony B YouTube user and what he likes to do. So very well done kit, very well done documentation. So we're gonna go ahead and do this. All right, now that I have the receiver tilted up so we can see the bottom of it, we took the bottom plate off. I wanna see um, what we have to work with. Um, before sticking your hands inside, make sure that it is actually unplugged. So, anyways, from what I can tell, it's gonna be tricky to get some of this stuff, or get to some of the stuff, but it's not unusual for Pioneer gear, and, and a lot of this gear from that era. Um, this must be the lower power supply board that they were referring to. We have one capacitor, we have five smaller diodes, and we have four larger diodes. Let's make sure that everything on this thing matches. So we have, there's a resistor, we have four larger diodes, check. And then sure enough, there are the smaller diodes at the top here. And then there's the one capacitor. What is its value? It is, 10 volt, 470 microfarad. That is huge. Yeah, we certainly have had advances in technology. So 470, yep, we're good. So that will work. So we can remove this board. I'm carefully going to take, I'm gonna take the screws out and I'm gonna carefully move this out of the way. But before I do, I'm starting to think, um, because I have to clean this face anyways, I'm probably gonna remove this face and get it out of the way just to make sure it doesn't get damaged. And we have to clean behind this glass anyway. This face is very similar to the one that's on the SX-780. So let's get this face off, which is a matter of pulling the knobs. I think there might be a set screw on this knob. No, there isn't. So it's just a matter of pulling the knobs and um, pulling the these guys here and then taking the screws out. See the vinyl wrap is starting to come apart here. We're gonna have to replace that. So yeah, there's some screws here at the top that have to come off. There's one there. There's one on the other end down here. And don't recall if there's anything on the bottom, but I do know they hide nuts behind these. So let's 
Let's get this face off. Taking the knobs off, as I suspected, there is a nut there and there's one there. So I already took the screws out here on the front and they're over here. So once I take those off, that should loosen this face up because it's already wanting to come off. And um, that should be good. Meanwhile, what I like to do is, everybody's different, but what I like to do is I like to take all of my parts and put them in bags or containers. I have some of those dishwashing detergent containers, which I have them all full right now with supplies and things. But I like to put all of this stuff in these bags so they don't get lost because sometimes I can't complete the project all in one weekend and I have to bounce between projects. So when I have to move it off the bench, because this is the only area I got to work, I have to set things off to the side, like over here and things like that. I don't want things getting lost. So um, some people, you can just get these baggies and label and mark individual screws where they go so you don't mix them up. Um, my case, I kind of can figure out where they go, so I just throw them all in there anyways. And now I can get that out of my way, but I got to take these nuts off first. And just like that, the face is off. So we can actually carefully set that off to the side and make sure that that doesn't get damaged any more than what it already has. Just have to be super careful with everything in here because things are now exposed. Otherwise, I don't want that getting damaged. So you can clearly see the blemish is like this is the original color and this is just staining in there. So I've got to scrub this thing and clean it up, but I've got to be careful. I'm going to use a little bit of a magic eraser to clean this up, but I'm not going to scrub it or keep going at it or you're going to take the screen printing right off and you're going to take the texture off too. You don't want to do that. You just want to lightly, lightly clean this guy and try to get it back to what it looks like it's supposed to look like. So we're going to carefully get that out of the way and then we're going to proceed on with this. There's also a big washer that goes here that just sits there. I put it in the bag already, but don't lose that big washer and it's the only washer that's on this, this row. So I think I'm gonna change the approach a little bit. I got these two screws out here and here and I have the one down there out. They're over there and out of my way, but I can't get this board out because the two big capacitors that are on the other side that you have to replace anyways, have these wires attached to them. And it's hard to manipulate these and try to pull them out. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and change those two big caps while I have this board out because it's gonna be easier. So we have two brown wires here at the top. Actually, we have three. We have three brown wires on this lug. We have one black wire on this lug. We have three red wires on this lug and one black wire on this lug. So we are going to just remove those wires and we're going to get this board out of the way. It'll be a lot easier so I can hinge it up the best I possibly can because working with these wire wraps is no fun. And then once I pull these wires off, I'm gonna solder them onto the new one. Um, also, just as with anything, a rebuild kit isn't necessarily gonna fix your problem because you have to make sure you don't have blown fuses and your typical stuff like dirty connections. I know this power switch is flaky, so I gotta do something with that. Um, dirty connect or dirty uh, connections, potentiometers, bad solder joints, blown fuses, things like that, the typical stuff. Once all the wires are out of the way, it makes it easier to manipulate. These are a little tight, but just working with them a little bit, I was able to bend that out of the way. But you can only do this so many times before these wires break. And I sure, I'm sure there are wire wrap tools out there to make this easier, but I can't stand wire wrap, and I'm just gonna solder them when I'm done anyways. Um, anyway, so when you go to replace these big capacitors, make sure you take a note of the polarity of where the capacitors are facing. On these older ones, the black is actually the negative, so we know the negative faces towards the tuner board. While we have that board out and the wires cut off and loose from these guys, we need to take these guys out. And as we just mentioned, the, the uh, negative side faces that direction. So there are two, actually there are four screws there that hold these capacitors in place. So we can take out the screw here and move it out of the way. And then we can take out the screw back here, which is hard to get to with this bundle of wires. So just be careful not break anything of course 
So we have that loose out of the way now. It's the same screws that the other ones are, so we'll just put them together. And that capacitor should be loose, and it is. So what are these? These are negative black, 50 volt, 1500 microfarads. So that one has been removed, and we're going to remove the other one. Now that both of them are removed, we can make a quick observation here. That one is starting to get a little bulged out, but it looks relatively okay. That one is extremely bulged out. So, yeah, that's uh, that's not good. So, the documentation that was written is absolutely correct in the fact that these capacitors are going bad. The next thing we need to do to reinstall the new ones is we have to make a note again which one's negative so we know that the negative is the black and it was aimed towards the tuner board so it goes in here that way we can also position this bracket back onto the new capacitor in the correct spot and in the correct depth so we want to line up get this put in the correct spot and the correct depth so this lines up properly and this lines up properly and it's the same height level so we can bolt it onto the chassis so that's what we are going to do next and like that, we got the bands moved over. The indication on these particular capacitors is they have a minus sign stamped into one pin and a positive sign stamped into the other. Capacitor number one is installed. We got to make sure the minus sign faces towards the tuner board. And then we're going to install the second one. It's pretty close. It's not exact, but close enough. The new capacitor is installed. And we got that out of the way we can focus on getting the components replaced on this board which if you remember from the documentation we got to change diodes over here diodes over here and this capacitor here so we're going to go ahead and replace all of that and get this board reinstalled as expected the negative marking was on my side i removed the capacitor and i'm taking a look at the circuit board and sure enough the marking is correct on the circuit board so the documentation is accurate in that regard while soldering in the new capacitor I wanted to take a quick inspection of the obvious and sure enough we've got some issues going on down here where the um, uh, the tie points are for the wire wrap so we're gonna have to resolder those too so you always want to keep things like that in mind that the documentation doesn't tell you the diodes are polarized so when you remove them you always want to make sure you want to pay attention how they're removed in this case the band was facing towards the chassis and they have been that particular diode has been removed so when we put the new one in we need to make sure that while wow, that one rolls away uh, that the band focus goes towards the chassis on that particular diode all right all that's done now and these were a pain in the butt to get out I mean they were just pain because of how thick they are and I couldn't get this nozzle around it. It was fun anyways. Got it in there, got the boards in there. Now there's all my old parts just thrown in there. I'm not sure why they have us replace the diodes but I'm doing it anyways because it's a rebuild. So the next step is to get these wires threaded through the correct posts and there's some holes here. I should be able to get this guy to fit through there. Um, I will have to look at my reference photos to make sure I get the right ones, but I should be able to feed those through there, wrap them around, and solder them in place. Alrighty then. All that's done. The new diodes are in there on both sections, new capacitors, and the two new main filters are in there. I got the uh, wires all wrapped in and soldered in place that board should be good to go we are going to take a look at the one on the top as it explained in the documentation we should do next so that's what we are going to do all right with that board out of the way we need to move the next to the next one item on the list which is bottom power board we're going to move on and it says right here that we need to move on to the top power supply board is there any notes that I need to take a look at but we're not going to look at that because the video is getting long. So what we need to do to get that board out 
is all of this stuff is all soldered and wire tied into place so that's going to be hard to get to but there's a screw here there's a screw there this one i just snapped out of that snap clip so it's loose and there is a screw hidden on the bottom here that you can't tell it's right there and then it's underneath this heat sink anyways and there's another one down here so i got to get to all four of those screws and my hope is that i can actually take this board and i can swing it up like this so the solder joints are facing this way but uh we're gonna have to play that one by ear my my worry is that these wires are gonna get in the way um but we'll see i'm gonna lift it up and see if i can't swing it out and then we're gonna start working on that so that's exactly what i was able to do take the screws out and lift it up however there are no screws at the bottom like i thought there were they're just slots and if i would have took a second to read it tells you that uh you'll need to remove two screws and swing it up so exactly how i thought it was going to be except for the two screws uh replace the capacitors most of the caps on the board are upgraded in voltage the two big 330 microfarad 50 volt caps are upgraded to 470 volt the originals were underrated for this location that's an interesting thought process i wonder where that data came from but um that's pretty thorough we'll see how that goes the new caps have slightly thicker wires, but you can wiggle them through the holes. There are 600 microfarad 50 volts and 100 microfarad 35 volt. These are all replaced with new 100 microfarad 63 volt caps. You got to watch when you raise the voltage like this because you can actually increase the ESR of the capacitor. It's probably not critical in a linear power supply, but just, just FYI. There are two 330 microfarad 6.3 volt caps, which are replaced with 10 volt ones. The three 220 are upgraded to 25 volt. The single 3.3 and 4.7 are replaced with the same, but higher voltage. There are two tiny sky blue 0.22. These are replaced with the new small 0.22 red WIMA film capacitors. Uh, they can go in either way. There are a pair of big red caps in the kit marked 225K. Those will be used for something else later. Once you have all the caps installed, solder them in, test it, replace the transistors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll do just that. We'll start with the capacitors and see where we are from there. But before we do, I want to take a peek at the backside. And again, I'm noticing some pretty crummy solder joints from heat over the years. So um, some of the stakes have bad solder, not all of them. There's some down here towards the end that are starting to crack and break. So again, just like the bottom board, we need to touch up the solder joints too after we replace the parts because it will make it easier to do so. We grabbed our next bag of parts, which happened to have all been in the main bag. Um, and we take a look at our parts here that we have. So these must be the two film capacitors that he was talking about that aren't used in this circuit, which makes sense because I don't see anywhere in the circuit where you're going to insert that. So. We will take these two, just as like was stated in the documentation, and we are going to set them aside. Of course, again, I need 5,000 hands to do this with, so, all right. We'll set those aside. We'll put those back in the kit for now, and yeah, there's our parts. We're going to get started with the capacitors first, and I'm just going to start changing everything, and if I run into anything significant, I will stop and get it on video. I'm already in a couple capacitors, and I wanted to show something. Um, these things have seen a hard life. I mean, look how brown they are on the tops, and then, or on the bottoms, I mean, there, and then that one's the, yeah, they've been hot, they've had a hard life, and it was time for them to go. We're several capacitors in at this point, and I finally found one that's leaking right here, if it will focus. Focus! Yeah, well, it's right there, and that's the one that was literally right behind that heat sink. So, not surprised that it's leaking, but it is. So, it had to go, along with the rest of them. I just want to note, as I go through this board, the person who put this kit together and did all of this work has done a very thorough job because um, he's paid good attention to the lead spacing. Same thing with this small capacitor over here. And with the notes, two of the capacitors were replaced with these film caps. And even those, I have one of them installed so far, even those 
have the correct lead spacing. So someone has paid so much attention to detail and putting this together. Um, I'm impressed so far. So I think if any of you have a 750 you want to do an overhaul with, you should go with this guy's kit. So um, I just wanted to put that out there from what I've been finding as I've been doing this. So I just removed the two bigger capacitors that the kit provider decided to say to upgrade. So one thing you want to do is it leaves the residue and glue and pieces of rubber behind as you remove it. I highly recommend that you remove this glue because there's some formulas of this glue that actually goes conductive and starts corroding things. Even though there's only one jumper link here and there's nothing in the vicinity, it's probably not um, too concerning. But just so the capacitor sits flat and my OCD, I'm going to scrape all of this off. And I recommend you do it too. Whether you do it or not, it's up to you. But that's what I'm going to do. What I found, the best way to get that off is using a little hot air pencil and just scraping it either with a flat blade or pick tool or something like that and it'll just come off real easy otherwise it's, it's it's extremely difficult so the next thing we have to do now that we got the capacitors in place is to work on the transistors actually we got to do those two in there and there's over there i gotta put in but i want to start looking at the transistors and this is where you got to pay very careful attention so on step five, it says replace the transistors. You will need to use the service manual to identify which transistor is which. So I'm going to do it a little different. If you're a novice, I recommend following exactly the directions. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull one transistor out at a time. And then I'm going to look at that transistor and then compare it against what the value is here versus what is replacing it. Then I'm gonna grab the one that's crossed and then put it in its spot and make sure, again, make positively sure you get the emitter, base, collector in the right spots or things are just not gonna work properly. So when reading the instructions to do this job and trying to understand what he's saying can be somewhat confusing. So I wanna point this out. This was the one transistor I just pulled. I pulled it from that location here, okay? That is the 2SC945, which says in the paperwork that it's replaced with these KSC18. What are they? KSC1845s. So that's what they're replaced with, and it says it goes in the same way as the 945, but not the 869. So here's what can happen. All the transistors in this kit are emitter, collector, base, except the three metal backs. So we do know that emitter collector base is the kit and what that actually means is this when you're looking at the transistor in this where it's facing you the letters emitter collector base so that should be base that could be should be collector and that should be emitter well there's a couple ways to verify that to make sure one way most people i see on youtube videos anymore are using those little cheap chinese component testers and there's nothing wrong with that but I'm old school. I like doing things the old school way. So I know how to test an NPN transistor using a standard multimeter in diode check mode. So that means this is going to be fun to get on camera. At the same time, I'm trying to hold the camera while uh, filming this. So if this is the base on the left-hand side and the emitter is on the right-hand side, I should get a tone. And I do not. So if I flip the transistor like I just did and I do this, I do get a tone, which is 0.675. No, I'm going to go back to the way. Now, if I do the same thing in the middle, it's 0.670. Emitter is always going to be higher than the collector because of a, a value known as R prime E. And transistor theory will explain that to you. But R prime E is why the emitter is higher than the collector. So this is the emitter. This is the collector. This is the base. So E, C, B, which means the base... The base is on that side. So if I'm looking at this correctly, emitter, collector, base. So that's, so hold on, let me drop that. Emitter, collector, base. So that's correct if you're looking at it like this. Emitter, collector, base. So this is the base. That's the collector, that's the emitter. We have double verified that with my multimeter. So we know that 
for a fact. So the next thing we need to do is this, the C is dignified as an NPN transistor. A is dignified or is a, is a PNP transistor. So, but if you pull all the transistors, which you don't want to ever do, and you screw that up, if you look on this board, the symbol is on the board. So if you look carefully, you see the arrow pointing to that hole. That is the emitter. The collector is the leg next to that. And on the back where the line is, is the base. So that is the base, that is the emitter, and that is the collector. So when I go to put this transistor in, since we know the base is on this side, that means I have to put the base here, and I have to put the collector there, and I have to put the emitter up here. So that means in theory that the transistor goes here, this pin goes there, and that pin goes in there. I can need both hands, but that's that's it. So if the base is over here on the right hand side, which it is, we have to put the base, we have to put the emitter here in that hole, and we have to put the collector in that hole there. We have to put the base in that hole. So this for this for the 1845 this transistor here that is the correct orientation that it goes in according to the diagram on the board that's what I wanted to try to clarify in case you get confused with the instructions if you buy this kit okay I retract my earlier statement of not downloading and printing the service manual or at least downloading it uh, as indicated in this documentation because in this case in this receiver it's absolutely necessary and here's why um, so I just removed the next transistor out of the circuit, which is right here. It's also an NPN transistor. And looking at the part number, it's a, it's a 2SC1847 or 1647. Yeah, it's a 1647. Here's the problem with that. In this documentation, nowhere does it state 1647. And it says Q1 through Q4, and probably the issue is the board's not labeled with the Q numbers. So you absolutely have to have the service manual to double verify. So he is correct and I am incorrect in that statement. So I'm going to go pull the service manual so I can figure out what Q number that transistor is. All right. So after the egg on the face, I went ahead and printed out the manual. Unfortunately, they kind of split it like that. But so the transistor I removed is right here. And if we look at the orientation of that, we have our... Let's see, 2SC, let's, am I looking at this correctly? No, I'm not. So, what I need to do is I need to look at it like, pretty sure, like this. So, nope, that is incorrect as well. What is going on here? This board must not be the correct board. It has to be because there's the relay. Huh. So, unless this is in reverse, I guess it could be that. Looking at it mirrored. So, there should be a double transistor. Hmm. And then a. Yeah, maybe. There's a capacitor there. Alright, so this is confusing because this is thing is split. I don't like that. Let's see, la 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 la. Let's see, there's R27, 220 ohm, one what? Where are you? Okay, you're back here next to the relay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because it's cut off. So there's a diode in the transistor. Okay, so die in the transistor so if I look at it like this which is incorrect so it's literally mirrored you gotta look at it like that that's stupid why would you do that oh well it is what it is so we know that this is the diode transistor and a double transistor here which is this this one and these two guys there so 
We go all the way up to the very end. There's our two capacitors, which it shows in there and there, which is these two here, and then the one behind it. So we're good. So I replaced this transistor here, which is accurate because there it is. So I'm on the next one up on the other side. So if I replace this one, this one is Q4 2SC 1647. I believe that is accurate. If I can get it in the light. Yeah, this is almost not readable anymore. Yeah, anyways, so that's Q4. And we know by reading this documentation that Q1 and Q4 are probably C4945 and A6. Well, it's neither one of those. They are these are all replaced with the new KSC 1845. So Looking at the manual from the transistor that I removed versus what this documentation shows, that should be the same transistor that I have over here. So, always double verify. Open mouth, insert foot. The gentleman that created this kit is absolutely correct. All right, all the transistors are in place now. Um, well, not all of them. I still have three more to put in but I got all them those in there I also have this transistor here was an original green one but they give you a heat sink and a sill pad and just like the instructions I went ahead and thermal pasted the um, front side and back side of the sill pad and mounted the transistor it's very close to this resistor so you got to make sure the leads aren't shorting and all of that fun stuff and then um, that's it just got to put those three in there and then we're done with this board outside of putting this brand new relay in place and then we're good Okay, the instructions and this particular revision of the board has got me again And I want to point this out. That's why I'm doing this video. So everybody's aware of it So I get down to these last three transistors, which I already soldered one in so there's only two here and um, And I knew that the ones I had left were over here, but guess what? These transistors were not the transistors that went in this spot. Turns out the transistor here, one over here, the hidden way down there, and then there's one back here, uh, yeah, that goes right there, are those bigger transistors. Well, here's the funny thing. When I was replacing those transistors, every single one of these were the same transistor, except for like one of them, which is, I think this one, this one's a different one. This is a, a PNP. The rest of them were all the same. So they were all the same 1649s. So I'm looking at them. I'm like, what, what? So I'm looking at this manual here and it says um, that Q6, 9, and 11 are to be replaced with the 2383s, which are those right there. So 6, 9, and 11, well, 9's there, 11's here, and 6 is right here. So... According to the diagram here, they used 945s, but in this particular board, they used 1649s just as the rest of them. So, um, I, it's, yeah. Anyway, so I'm just going to go with the manual's recommendations. It's been pretty thorough so far. There has to be a reason why the person has upgraded those specific three transistors. One of them drives this one, so maybe that's why, um... But I'm just going to follow the directions exactly as it's specified, and that's how we're going to do it. All right, now I have all the transistors in the right spots. You know, that just goes to show with purchasing kits and not doing all the insane research to, to get to that point, you can run into this issue with specific transistors in specific spots, even though they're all the same. However, you could have went the long way and Googled until your, your heart's content and go through pages and pages of forums and wherever else and end up coming to the same conclusion where specific parts need upgrades or whatever else so just pay attention to that um the next thing we got to do is the relay which the original relay only has two rows of pins and this one has three so we have to trim off a row just make sure before you do that to trim off the correct row so there's a larger gap between these two sets versus this set so you can see there the large gaps here but we're not having a set there so we got to trim this particular row here off all right, so everything is now installed. Now is a perfect opportunity before you put this thing back into place to double check all of your connections. 
and I, I went ahead and touched up the spots that are the worst. I, these are hard to solder because it starts bubbling and doing all kinds of weird things. Um, so I did the best I can. And the best thing to do right now is to check for any missed solder joints and for any mistakes. So that side of the board looks okay. This side of the board, once again, double check for mistakes. Make sure your transistors are facing in the correct way. Make sure you caught all the caps, you didn't miss anything. And once all that's done, we can complete this board and put it away and work on the next one. So according to the order of operations and the documentation, the next thing we need to work on is the tuner. Now we'll do the big tuner board. This usually has a phone EQ section and all that fun stuff. Um, and it's pretty elaborate. So, so you should be, this board is the muting board attached vertically in the middle. Ignore that one, we'll do it later. I'm probably gonna prep that anyways and unsolder those joints just to get out of the way. And then let's see, first replace the capacitors. Um, they do not have a polarity market. There's a little green 4.7 non-polar now we'll do the tone board okay tone board's too far ahead so if you have the vertical boards you will need to replace the transistors on them with the new a992 transistors which should go an opposite way assuming the old ones are 725 so we're going to have to confirm all that again too just to make sure uh but use the board markings to be sure if you don't have the vertical phono boards at the back it wants you to do the tone board and then do the muting board. I don't know why it's wanting it in that order. I need to figure that out because it's, you know. Um, yeah, I don't, because the tone or that well, vertical board's right here and it has to get untangled out of that mess. Uh, so, tone board's down here, which is completely totally separate which is going to be fun to get out of there by the way with all of this in the way oh man i gotta think about that uh i don't even want to think about it right now so i'm going to do this one some of these are going to be fun to get to as well so we might as well check the solder joints around there's some sketchy ones but nothing crazy check especially these so I'm not seeing back here. So I'm not. The little vertical boards or the, hold on, what was it? The phono boards that he was talking about? Um, do you have the vertical phono EQ boards? Okay, do I have those boards? Ah, yes I do, one and two. So yeah, those boards there have to come out and get redone as well, so. All right, um, <coughs> see if this even goes over it. No, <coughs> absolutely not. <coughs> I need a new, another tip for this, <coughs> unfortunately. <coughs> So I have to get it from the side. So I do have a little bit of braid over there behind my drink. So I can do it that way. But I'm just going to try to do this the lazy way. So, with any luck, that one's loose, that one is two, that one is two, that one's two, that one's loose, and that one's loose. So that board's loose. I'm not going to remove it because it says not to until later, but, ah, sucker. Anyways, so, that's loose now. Um, now let's... I've got a big bag of parts that says tuner. Get her all unpacked. Oh, so there's a bunch of them here that have to be done. Alright, so again, with these transistors, we're going to have to pay attention where they all go. There's one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, eight. There's eight of them here. So we'll we'll refer back to the notes again to figure out where they all go. But um, yeah, for now let's just do the capacitors and get them out of the way. There's quite a few of them that have to be done. So we'll go ahead and get that done. It's gonna be it's gonna be straightforward to get to the ones in the middle here. But there's one buried way back in here somewhere. It's hard to see. Yeah, like right back there. You know, right there. It's going to be fun to get to. Yeah. Anyways, let's get that done. All right, next thing. Um, trying to do some of these caps, and they're impossible to get to. Like, there's a pair of blue ones right here. And I had to... <laughs> I had to completely remove this bracket right here to get to it because it was in there like this and there was a bunch of wires through this connector there and all that had to be peeled away out of those uh, there's a screw back here that I had to undo and I had to undo the one off this vertical board just to get this out of the way it doesn't tell you that in the manual but you got to do that in order to get to those uh, capacitors right down in there unfortunately all right so i had to take this off because there's a capacitor that sits back here behind us or in front of the switch that you can't get to and in order to get that off there's multiple screws that come down here that has to come out but the problem is this dial cord string runs in front of this so you have to grab a pick tool or a spudger tool and then carefully get that string, run it down over this lip. So you just pull the string over and over and over. And the next thing you know, you slide this off that little sleeve and up and out of the way. And then keep going and it goes toing and it pulls right off. So that is now free. With that out of the way, you got to be careful because you do not want to break that dial string at all under any circumstances. Now that that's out of the way, I gotta take the rest of these screws out so I can get this plate off, including these nuts, because I can't get to anything. But that also has an interesting side effect of freeing the tone board, so now I can get to that to recap it next. All right, well that was a pain in the ass. So all of this hardware had to come off, including this sleeve and all that stuff, just to get this off. And then I left this on and just kind of pivoted out of the way because the capacitor that I need to get to, this one here, which I just took off, is right there. You can see the pads for it and see where it's set. What a pain in the ass. Now this board's loose now, but the good thing is, is while I'm in here, while I have all this apart, I might as well spray out these potentiometers and clean them, spray out these switches and clean those. I mean, might as well. I've already got it apart, and it's got to be done anyways. And now, at least I can get to this board and work with that. So, let's see. That's going to be... That's the tone board. And there's a couple cat. There's not very many parts on there that I have to worry about. But, uh, yeah. So, that was fun to get off. But I got it off. I managed to get it off. All right, so things are starting to get a little bit confusing, and I want to make some clarifications, or at least some assumptions and clarifications in case you run into this problem. So we're in the process of recapping this board. I've got uh, that electrolytic replaced. All the electrolytics are replaced on this board. And some reason, I still have a bunch of them left over. Now, I have this board here. I'm like, well, maybe some of it goes there. But the problem with that is... Um, the muting board, it's called, already has components, so it doesn't go to there. I still have a few electrolytics left, these two, and then some others. Um, there's two electrolytics left on these boards that have to be changed, so that's probably these two here, but that still leaves three electrolytics and a handful of film capacitors left. So, I'm confused. So then I got to looking... Um, in this in this paperwork, it says now begin the tutor board. Usually, you know, phony Q sits above it. Have a pair of small boards. The tuner board should be accessible from underneath. Recapping this shouldn't affect the tuning. But what I like to do is replace the caps. Blah blah blah. First, replace the caps. There are a lot of these, and the reason why it says ignore the muting board is because it's bagged separately. So, 
First, replace the caps. There are a lot of these that are replaced with red Wilma film caps. A lot of which ones? Which are non-polar. For electrolytic caps, the three smaller, blah, 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 blah. We already know all that. So I've got all the electrolytic caps replaced, but there's no, there's no indication of where these go. So um, now I suppose it can go where these film caps are, or these uh, little, these here are older film caps. Unfortunately, there's some cracking going on, so maybe it may mean those, but I got to looking a little further into this board. There's these blue guys here. Those are tantalum capacitors. So there's one, there's two, three, four. There's a handful of them. Um, there's one up here in the front. Five. There's one over here somewhere. Six. And then there's some under here. Seven, eight, nine. 10 maybe total, which makes sense because there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 of those. All right. Um, maybe he means to replace the blue capacitors with the film capacitors, the tantalum capacitors. Tantalums are known to short, especially when they get old, so you should change them. Um, I'm assuming that's why, again, it's an assumption. So the instructions are not clear that you need to change those blue tantalum capacitors. So I'm going to pull them and I'm going to double verify the values. And if they match the values that these red WEMA capacitors are, then that's what needs to be done. But I just wanted to make note of that because the instructions are not clear for this kit. So just FYI. Okay, two things. One, that's absolutely what it is. The tantalum capacitors are replaced by film capacitors. However, the second thing is I have an extra one of these, extra one of those, two extras of those, and I'm short one of those. So there must have been several production run changes and design changes of this board over the um, evolution of this device. So the kit that I bought does not compensate for this board revision. So um, I have one cap here. And then that one goes right there. And then I need another one up here. Then once I do that, there are no more blue capacitors left. They're all in there. And then one of them or two of them was replaced with electrolytic like that one there. And then down here, there's another one right by the potentiometer that was replaced. There it is. It was replaced with an electrolytic. So... Or no, it's right here. Yeah. So, there's no more blue tantalum capacitors left. As far as I can tell. So, that means the parts that I have do not match this border vision. So, now i got to go pull the service manual, the other pages of the service manual, and take a peek of the capacitor values and see if what I have matches or I made a mistake somewhere. I don't think I made a mistake somewhere, but you never know. Um, however, I have one and I need another one of these, but I got two, all these are extra. They don't go anywhere. They don't, there's no place on the board for them to go. So there must have been design changes as time goes on. So let me get that situated and find out what's going on. So I figured out where the one 0.1 UF capacitor goes. It was hiding up underneath this rotary switch so I got that now uh, however there's two that I'm missing and I only have one I'm missing the other I know where these go but these two don't go anywhere and that's extra so yeah there must have been a design revision but so to move on to these phono boards I pulled them out of the circuit and then guess what happened the ribbon cable thing just disintegrated on me so now yeah, all these are shorted together. It's just, it's literally just falling apart. So I'm going to have to take all that off and replace it with axe, probably ribbon cable or something like that. I'm going to have to replace that. So just some things to be aware of. So don't pull these all the way out. I mean, you kind of have to to work on it, but this is what happens. 
So you'll, you need to have a backup solution on hand when you do that. So I gotta figure out what that actually is. Okay, so here we go again. Yet another problem. Um, according to the paperwork, these are supposed to have four A992s. Well, these are the replacement A992s. But guess what? These have both PNP and NPN. See, there's an NPN. 2SC1313. 2SA725. So this board is not the same as what the documentation was written for. Oh, man. That's the problem with kits. Think, just thinking, I, you know... This is going to go smooth. No problem. Guess what? Nope. I should have known better. Oh, well. I'm starting to get frustrated now because I just, these things just fighting me tooth and nail. Unfortunately, I began to take that transistor out and I'm like, you know, it's time to replace it. And, oh, that's not going to work. So, oh, well, just got to hope it, they're still good, which I don't see them being a problem anyways. The only reason why they're replaced is because they get noisy. So, well, let's see. Documentation. Install transistor, blah, blah, blah. All right, transistor. A725, A992. Well, unfortunately, these are not. There's the A725, so I can at least replace those. But the two SCs, I cannot replace. Well... Just goes to show you, they're not all the same. Plus, the ribbon cable disintegrating on me. That was nice, too. All right, so, studying this board a little more, three of these four are actually the correct transistors. They are the 2SA725, and the 2SA725, these particular ones, the KSA992, are reverse. So base is on the left versus the base on the right. So it goes base, collector, emitter, which is the opposite of this particular transistor. So when you put these in, you actually have to flip them around the other way versus what these originally were. And the documentation states that if it uses these transistors. I just do not have this particular one. I assuming the reason why they are replacing these is because this is the phono amp and they want to keep this low noise. Uh, and these transistors are known for getting noisy. Um, so there's not much I can do about that one because this design's slightly different. So I'm going to have two of these that are left over. So now it's time to throw that capacitor into this board and then do the other board and then we're ready to go. I just have to find a solution for that thing. Alrighty then. So I went ahead and replaced the three out of the four on each board. So that leaves me two extra transistors left over and there must have been some parts differences because I got a couple more capacitors left over. But I got everything in there. Double check the service manual for this board. Everything is where it should be. Um, the There was two one microfarad caps going in here. Um, I saw some variances showing 2.2s so I stuck the two 2.2s I had left over so that leaves me a, a one, an extra one microfarad left over which is probably not populated on this board and then this one here is left over, which is a 2.2 at 50. It's also probably not populated. And these two extra transistors, because these are actually MPNs instead of PNPs. So, got some ribbon cable now. I went through my uh, hoard and cut up some old cable from an old cassette deck, and now that's installed. So, that at least looks better. And I got rid of the old rotten cable, so I can reinstall those. All right, I got the... Uh, phono preamp boards in there and you can tell by the design that the board was originally designed for an IC but um, they had substitute boards at one time but anyways the pin one stripe indicator I got one of the cables reversed but who cares it doesn't matter they're going the same direction electrically so that's all that matters uh, so that's installed all the caps are done I still have a few over here that's left over but uh, I want to take a detour, and before I move on to the next board, because the documentation says move on to the tone amp, but um, I wanted to take a detour and start looking at the front panel here. So, while I have the thing ripped apart, I might as well do the bulbs on the front. And this one here, I just pulled one of the bulbs out. These appear to be just little 8-volt indicator bulbs, and I have some of those on hand. And this is actually still rubber. Now... <laughs> This, on the other hand, 
it ain't rubber no more. It's very, it's hard as a rock. And that contains the power bulb and the stereo bulb. And the reason why it's hard as a rock is this power bulb probably remains illuminated all the time. So, uh, and of no surprise, the power bulb's burned out. Also, um, one of the three uh, dial indicator bulbs works, but the other two are blown. But you can see the tungsten evaporation is pretty bad on those. I got to see if I have these on hand because I do not know if I have these at all. Uh, yeah, I got to see if I have those. Um, I'll have to look in my kit, but I know I have the bulbs for the front. I don't know if I have the bulbs for the dial. Um, but I actually have the light bulbs. I don't want to go LED because I'm trying to keep this thing with its original charm as I possibly can. So I'm going to go replace these with incandescence. Uh, the indicators probably don't matter so much if they're LED or not, but the dial lamp, you want that same warm white color. They do make white LEDs that do that, but the problem with LEDs, this is typically hooked up to AC. So you end up getting a flicker. At least on my 780 it did, because I stuck LED bulbs in the 780 and it, it had a flicker to it. Uh, so I, I want to actually use bulbs. If I if worse comes to worse, I'll use LEDs and use filter capacitors, but um, I got to see in my stash what I have. But I wanted to take a detour off recapping and get the front panel taken care of. Also, these bulbs typically pull out the back very simple without tearing all this apart. But the reason why I had to get all this apart to begin with is because this rubber went rock hard, this bulb would not pull out of the hole. So I had to actually push it from this end while pulling it just to get this bulb out. So that's why all this is apart. Well, I decided to take a step back. I took this bulb apart and it's, it's all sealed. So this is some specialty type thing. This is not a standard bulb. So I got to order these. I do not have these. So I can't do anything about this right now, but also I went to do one of the smaller bulbs and as I was working with it and doing the heat shrink, one of the leads snapped off the bulb. So I'm done with it. I'm not messing with it right now because I have only got so many of those bulbs and they're expensive. So I don't want to break any more leads considering I still have to manipulate things in and out of the board when I get to the rest of these. So I'll save the bulbs until last. I got the stubborn one out anyways. So I put the screws back in now that I got all the stubborn ones out because all these come out real easy. Um, it was just these over here that were a problem. So I got that out. I'm gonna go ahead and start working on this board now and we are going to get the caps replaced. It also included um, replacement capacitors for these tantalums just like the ones below. So we're gonna take care of that next. So you carefully, when you get to this board, once you unsolder the bottom of it like we did earlier in the video, You've got to carefully finagle these pins around these wires and swing it out of the way like so. That way we can actually get to the stuff and get to the back side and unsolder things and place the new components on. Just carefully swing it out of the way. And then pay attention to these wires. If you have to, mark which way they go in case one breaks off because these wires are solid core. They're not stranded so they can break off real easy. And just like that, we're done. All the new capacitors are in place. There's only five of them. There's this one, this one, and these three. And there was no concern in documentation about the transistors on this board, so we're just gonna put it back together. And I did this ahead of the tone board because I already had it apart, unlike the documentation, so your mileage may vary on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the bracket put back in here, get the wire snaked through, and get it anchored together, and then we're gonna move on to the tone board. All right, so I got the bracket reinstalled and the wires now, you know, routed through it. Uh, there's probably one or two I missed because they're so tight I can't really get them in there. So uh, two things. One, I went ahead and re-soldered all of the wire wrap lugs because they were just atrocious. And re-soldered the tuner connections here and I re-soldered the selector switch for the inputs because they were kind of crusty looking. I did the potentiometers and while I'm thinking about it uh, while I have it up like this I have to do two things I need to might as well spray out these controls while I have the thing apart like this I'm gonna grab my um, my uh, deoxid f5 fader control cleaner for this one 
And then I'm going to use the cheap GC electronic stuff for this selector switch here. And uh, these switches here. Nothing doesn't need to be anything special. And then I need to work on the tone board. But before I can do that, I have to remove this cover. And right un in here, where all these ground lugs go, of course they're going to be all in the way. There's a screw right back in there that I have to unscrew so this can slip out of the way. It's going to make it easier to maneuver, maneuver this board, which it'll also make it easier to get to this switch here because this power switch, I noticed when I was testing this thing um, before I took it apart, it was kind of intermittent and arcing a little bit. So I need to see if there's anything I can do about that. I don't know if I can because it uses a rivet to hold them together. So I would need screws with nuts on them to replace the rivets if I take this apart. So I got to inspect it. Maybe if I can get some cleaner down in there. I don't know. Um, I'm not holding much hope for that. But I need to get to these controls anyway. And I need to recap this board as explained in the documentation. So um, I'm clearly doing it based off the documentation on this video versus using my own intuition. I've tried to insert my own intuition here a little bit. But it's come to bite me in the ass a couple of times. So I'm just kind of following the documentation until I run into discrepancies and I'll look at the service manual. So for now, let's uh, do all that and get it out of the way. As far as cleaning the controls are concerned, I like to use this stuff for the potentiometers. And then I use this stuff for the switches and contacts and stuff like that. This is the cheap stuff. Um, if you use this stuff on potentiometers, you gotta go back with you know the little tube of fader lube or whatever else. Um, I'm not going to get into extreme detail on this because there's a YouTube video out there by YouTube user X-Ray Tony B and he does a very good in-depth video on this stuff and how to clean these potentiometers properly. So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel and I will uh, refer you to that video if you need more details on how all that works. Um, I may put the link in the description below on re referencing that video. So um, we're going to go ahead and clean these controls and move right along. All right, now we have our little bag of parts for the tone board. I got the metal moved out of the way. I got the screw so I don't lose it. Matter of fact, I'm going to move that screw over here so it's not lost. Uh, and then now we have our parts, which I'm going to get out of the bag and unload them. All right, without stuff flying everywhere. So we have two non-polar caps and a bunch of polar ones. So now let's look in the instructions and see if there's any, let's see, vertical muting board, done all that. Let's see, nope. Tone board. This is attached to the tone controls, a couple of switches you need to pull the faceplate. Yeah, we did all of that. Let's see, under the screws. Be careful with these. If you slip, you'll scratch the face. Yep, that's why I took the face off. Remove the face plate, remove whatever is holding the tone board, which was that little metal plate that we removed there. So we're going to, so this board gets all the capacitors replaced. They should be pretty easy. Remember that the new red Wyma film capacitors are non-polar, so they can go either way. Solder all the caps in, trim the wires. This is a good chance to clean the potentiometers and switches with deoxidant and other contact cleaner. Yep, exactly. So reinstall the board and move on to the next step. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. So we're going to start pulling out. I can swing this out just enough to be able to get to things without going crazy. And I can also get down here to these lugs, check the solder joints, redo those, as well as work at this switch, see if I can't get some of that cleaner in there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Dang, all complete. That was the easiest board of the whole bunch to do. Uh, now I just have to clean the controls and move on to the one that I'm dreading the most. And that is this board getting it out. And that's the problematic board in the whole thing. The good news is once I get that board done, that's it. It should in theory work. But I got to get that out somehow. That's going to be really fun. All right. The controls are cleaned. Switches are cleaned. Everything's done over here. So uh, at this point, it's just a matter of putting... 
the stuff back on the front. I still have to spray the switch out. I forgot to do that, so I'm going to do that here in a second. Uh, I'm going to put the face together, put it all together, and, well, I'm not going to put the metal face on yet because I still got to do some cleaning, but I'm definitely going to get the um, metal cover on that goes here and get the dial cord back in the groove so I get less scared of it breaking because you have to be very careful. All right, so... The face plate is back on, well at least this plate's back on, so we can get um, that out of the way. So I got the dial cord string back into its channel and everything still operates smoothly there, no problem. So I didn't break the dial string, thank God. Okay, the next thing is the amplifier module. This one's going to be fun. Did I mention that I hate wire wrap? So I have that same problem over here too. So. Um, getting this out's not going to be easy because there's two screws. There's one on the top, one on the bottom here. Well, here and here, but it only sits into a, like a channel in the back there. So this board has to swing out this way. The problem is all of these wire wrap ordeals are going to be hard because hell, this one here is so tight. You can't even, you can't move this. Then the output transistors are cabled in on the back here and the two B plus power cable leads are actually soldered to that board as well. So this one's going to take some thinking to figure out how to remove. And chances are I'm probably going to have to just take these wires off, cut them off. I know they probably make a tool for this, but I don't like these things anyway. So I'm going to probably take a wrap or two off and cut it. So then when it comes to putting this board back, I'll just solder them back in place. Um, most likely because we have the yellow wire here which has to come off this wire goes on the bottom it comes around and goes through there somewhere so I'm not sure where it goes it's probably a speaker output or something uh, this one's got to come off this one goes to the other lug so it doesn't these two have to come off that's audio input that one's got to come off that one's got to come off and then these two as well cable here all this stuff all those wires have to come off so I'm going to remove those and then hopefully I can actually slide this board out because I can't I can probably lift it out of the groove and slide it out the back but I can't lift the whole assembly out because there's screws there there and it's anchored to the back here and there's a lip so it's not going to want to yeah so huh this one's tricky let me think about this for a minute. All right, well, I got the amplifier board out of there. Of course, I had to take reference photos and remove every single one of these wires. And there's no room for error because some of these wires are so short, if you break the wire off, there's not enough to strip it back. So what I wanna do is just, when I put this board back in, is to wrap it one or two turns and solder it because I, I hate wire wrap. What I need to do is actually order up a wire wrap tool so I can undo those because it's just it's just too painful. And uh, that's I guess that's just how these were done back then because uh, even some of the old computer systems were all wire wrap like that. So it was just easier to do, I guess. Now you got connectors and everything else, which makes life a lot easier. So we got this board out now. Um, according to the documentation, these are very hard to replace and they're very brittle and they are exactly right because that's typically what happens so what I want to do myself is I want to remove those diodes because I do not want them breaking at all because I'm going to be working with this board for a little bit so best thing to do is to just pull them off so they do not get broke and what I want to do is I want to position it like this and when I remove these if I can actually do it without breaking the wire and rendering this whole thing moot hang on I gotta put the camera down what I want to do is I want to move those and save them out of the way over here so I know which channels they go in Besides getting the bulbs for this, um, this leaves the final installment of this video, and this was the original problem to begin with. 
So we have our kit here for this particular board. And I have the two diodes set out of the way over there. And that's used for setting the bias point as the temperature drifts of the heat sink. It keeps the bias stable. So um, I have those out of the way. So now it's time to start redoing this thing. Um, I'm going to do the capacitors first. And then we're going to get to the transistors. Because according to this documentation, it says... Uh, amplifier board on the amp board electrolytic capacitors and there's two microfarad capacitors replaced with the Wyma film two trimmers are replaced Q3 Q4 is replaced uh, and then we get to this there's two A798 dual transistors on this board these act up over time and that's probably the issue we're having honestly and should be replaced replaced with a matched pair of A992 so the 798 they're referring to are is this here and this here, which if you look at it, there's multiple pins on the one package because there's two transistors inside there. So he went all the way of doing beta matching of all these transistors the best he possibly can. Um, so I think what we're going to do is probably keep the same thing. But what I want to do is I want to take a piece of heat sink compound a little bit of heat compound and I want to take two of these transistors and put them face to face and zip tie it and the reason why I want to do that is to keep it temperature stable so if one of these starts to get warmer than the other it will they will both get warm at the same time so because they're cup they're tightly coupled together there and for that reason so we're going to try to maintain that I'm going to try anyways now comes the fun part uh, I like the level of detail the kit designer did put into this they have the transistor numbers from what they tested at marked on for each transistor so you can closely match. For example, these two would be close and then these two would be close. Uh, and the reason why that is is because these are the differential input pair and there's no offset adjustment so these have to be closely matched. So what we're going to do, the instructions doesn't say for this but I'm going to do it anyways, is I'm going to put these transistors face to face with a little bit of thermal compound and zip tie them together. That way they track each other thermally. All right, everything is in the board. I didn't have any parts left over. These are the original ones. Apparently these go noisy. And, and when they do, if one of them tracks differently or gets noisy over the other one, it'll cause the offset to move around, the DC offset, because this board does not have an offset adjustment. And this design predates using what's called a current mirror in the differential stage. So if, if these aren't closely matched to almost exactly matched, it's going to cause the offset to drift around and that's what was going on in here so what I did was I actually took the two transistors I put some thermal compound in there and I zip tied them together and I did that on both channels I wanted to put them face to face but I can't because the footprint would just not allow me to do that so I just did it this way just to you know to, to at least get some kind of thermal competition or composition in here so what will happen is if one of the transistors gets warmer than the other or vice versa they'll track together keeping the the offset as close to zero as possible without you know drifting around so that's what my goal is the instructions does not say to do that um but or at least i don't know Let's see without any difficulty just use once you're done here all right yeah it doesn't mention that, but I did that anyways, just out of precaution, just to make sure this amplifier can be as stable as it possibly can be. Because I don't want to put all this in there and have to remove it all again because of that weird issue, because these are a pain in the ass to deal with. So, all right, all the uh, parts component replacement, I'll put this over there in my junk pile. The parts component replacement is finished. Um, the only discrepancy I ever ran into was the capacitors that went into this tuner board. This tuner board must be of a different revision. So I had a couple of parts left over. So it is what it is. Uh, the only other difficulty I ran into was this power supply board. Uh, they used they, On this revision, they decided to use all the same transistors. But on the documentation, it wants to take three of those and make them a different one. So I just went ahead and went with flow and did it per documentation so double checked all of my work as i went along and now i got this done so i'm gonna put it back up in there 
Uh, again, resoldering all the known trouble spots, which is what I did here. I also resoldered the connections to the plugs that go to the output transistors. I'm probably going to take a toothbrush and clean these up a little bit, or maybe a little bit of sandpaper, emery cloth, something like that, so it gets the best connection it possibly can through those plugs into the output transistor. So that's complete. Now it's po now it now really it's getting it all together, getting it all wired up, and um, do the bulbs. But I wonder if I want to give it a power on test first before I do the bulbs. I also have to grab the service manual so I can set the DC offset, or not offset, but the bias adjustments with those. Uh, for now, I'm going to go ahead and solder those varistors, resistors, diodes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's three diodes in one package, according to the symbol. Um, I want to solder those back in here and get it back inside the chassis. Alright, the board's mounted in there. Now I just have to go through my reference photos and get all of those wires all plugged back in there and hope that it works. I double checked everything that I did. Uh, it's all good. So let's just start getting all the wires on and then we can get ourselves positioned into a power up test. I got to get the service manual information and so I can adjust the two pots. I think those are the bias pots. I'll have to adjust those for idle current. Uh, I may have to do it twice when this gets up to temperature and then do it again. So um, I might need clip leads to get, depends on where I have to put the probes for this. So yeah, we'll figure that out. But for now, that's it. Let's get it put back together. I'm shooting this one from my stove for the moment because the bench is occupied with all the other stuff. If you remember, this thing was crazily yellow and I had to scrub this thing pretty good and I got it really really clean as best as I possibly can I mean there's some spots here that are scratches and there's a little bit of yellowing but I really went at it I even went went at it with the magic eraser a little bit and I didn't want to go too heavy on the magic eraser or you'll take the screen print right off so I just did a light rub couple coats some Windex and some uh, you know cleaning agents Dawn stuff like that water cleaned all this up and it actually came out pretty good and uh it's even the plastic is fairly spotless so that actually came out well it didn't do too bad the knobs were pretty nasty too and you can tell they're still even even from scrubbing these with a toothbrush and a magic eraser there's still a little bit of yellow tinging on it but i tried i went at i went at it with windex and um, 409 and Dawn dish detergent I, or yeah I just, I just did what I could and there's even there's even some crap in the grooves here I tried to get at with a pick tool and it's still it's not perfect but it's certainly better than what it was it, it's not like nicotine yellow anymore it actually looks pretty decent well everything is soldered in place back in there uh, the only thing I don't have is the bulbs yet they're still loose try to keep them isolated keep that isolated uh double check triple check my work everything looks okay now it's the moment of truth does it work or does it explode in a ball of flames or maybe something in the middle where it pops a fuse so I'm gonna turn the multimeter on let's go back to our channel and hope that uh we don't have a problem hopefully we solved it now this was the shotgun approach of course but the problem is these these amplifiers are well known in the community and there's always a list of what commonly goes wrong with them so that's why I bought the kit I did took a different approach plus I don't have to go around chasing down parts in the middle of a pandemic when there's a semiconductor shortage right now so I got a shelf full of amplifiers that I can't do any repairs on right now because I can't get the parts. So, anyways. Um, okay, this is off. So, this is, this is the scary part. Plug the power in. Alright, power is in. Do we get anything at all? Got a light. 
Got to click. Oh, that's stable. That's stable. Wow. Okay. That is certainly good news. Let's move to the other channel here. I should have two meters around here, but I don't. I need to buy me another meter. I had a Craftsman, which is a, you know, an Aztec or whatever, x -Tech meter. It's the same design, same company. But I got rid of it. I gave it to a kid that needed it more than I did. Uh, yeah, anyways, try again. About the same. All right, so... No DC. All right, we have no DC. Now, we need to figure out um, which inputs this thing has. Turn the power on. AM, FM's burned out, phono, auxiliary. So we're gonna do AM. Do we have See, turn that up. Let's put this in AC volts mode and see if we get anything. Um, I don't know. Anyways, is there any AM reception at all? No. Let's go FM. Do we have anything on the FM scale? The needle moved, but we have no... Wow. Okay, so... We don't have any AM reception at all. So... Okay. So I'm assuming... Make sure this is... Oh yeah, she's getting warm fast. I'm definitely going to have to uh, go in there and do some work on the thing. Alright, volume's coming up. We got, we got activity. Yeah. Turn the volume down. Yeah. All right, I think now we should get some speakers hooked up to this thing. Uh, we know we have to replace the FM bulb. Stereo, I don't know yet, but we, we for sure have to replace this FM bulb. It's burned out. Uh, power, definitely. So, okay. Hey, not bad for a first power-up, and I didn't bench this thing along the way. I just kind of care was careful what I was doing, even though I screwed up a few times and referred back to the documentation. So... Let's get some speakers hooked up. I got a pair right there. Uh, I got to replace a tweeter in one of those because it's blown. And I want to get the speakers hooked up and I want to get uh, a check on sound, let it run for a bit, and then go into the service manual and set the bias to be where it's supposed to be. So let's do that next. All right, so... I was jamming this thing out for a bit to try to get it to warm up so I can do the adjustments. Both channels are working properly. However, there's an issue. And actually, there's a couple issues. One, the contacts are just gone in that power switch. So I'm not sure what I want to do about that. But if you flip it to phono, hear that? Noise coming out of that channel. Well, if you remember, we only had three of the four transistors in this uh, kit because the one transistor was different, right? So there's the NPN transistor off in the corner. Now watch this. Turn the volume up. Can of upside down air. See? It just quit. So that fourth transistor is bad. And this is why we have to do transistor replacements on these particular machines. So not just 
recapping, but also retransistoring. Not all of them, just the specific ones. So that one's definitely got to be done. However, it appears that everything else is functional. Uh, we got a bulb blown in FM, so I got to do that. AM. See if we have anything come in on AM. It's been down for so long, and people are like, oh, we're playing Western. Well, we don't want that mentality anymore. We're at the same point, so, okay, oh, we're playing Western. That's a different type of mentality. It's like, uh, or, oh, holy crap. Yeah, you better and, get ready. You know, and, and I'm talking, <laughs> one, one of the officials came out, and, and the game last night is so kind of official. All right, so what I've noticed is that after it's run a little bit, this side is cooler. This side is almost too hot to touch. So this is warmer than this side. So that's expected because the bias pots need adjusted on each side. So I need to uh, pull the service manual and do that. But I needed to warm this up to operating temperature before I could actually do that. Now this thing is all warmed up and it's been running for a while now. These heat sinks are fairly hot. That one's very hot. This one is not nearly as hot. So we got a mismatch, which I'm not surprised there. So what we need to do now is we need the idle current biasing procedure. And if we look at the service information, uh, we have to connect our probes like shown for each channel. Well, there's channel one over here and channel two over there. And then it says to do not load the speaker terminal. So we got to disconnect and move the speakers. Uh, turn VR1 and VR2 shown in Vigor 17, fully counterclockwise, set the power switch to on, which we don't need to do that. One to two minutes after turning on, we set to 50 millivolts, let it run for 20 minutes, and then we set it to 30. Well, we're already at full operating temperature. The reason why you set it to 50 is so it can increase it to the, the operating temperature. So we're already at operating temperature, so we should be able to adjust this for 30 millivolts. So I got to work quickly while it's still warm. And then I need to get my probes down in there on, according to that, and then we need to do the idle current adjustment. And I have my adjustment tool right here that I'm going to use for that control and that control over here to adjust the idle current. And everything should be good at that point. And then all we got to do is just get the transistor for this backstage. Um, we'll have to order two of them. I don't have them on hand. Well... Maybe I do, but I have to figure out what they cross to in order to know. And then I've got to get the right bulbs. I've only got one in these, these weird bulbs, and this one's burned out. And I got the rest of them for the small ones. But then we can finally get this thing together. Well, almost. Power switch is screwed. It's bad, and it's proprietary, I think. So I've not seen one like that before. Uh, the contacts are probably just burned off, so I'm not entirely certain how I'm going to to repair that but anyways let's get the idle current set all right so 32 33 milliamps and we are targeting or not milliamps millivolts targeting for 30 so that's really 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 close so i barely barely have to touch this one so Let's carefully get this inserted. All right. Whoa, too high. Just very touchy. All right. Close enough. I'm not going to mess with it any further. So we need to move the next one, 11 and 16, which means I have to move to these. I'm going to do that with the power off because I do not want to break anything. So, 11 and 16. Okay. 16 and 11. So, uh, 16 is positive. So, we move positive to here. And we move negative to there. There. All in place. Now I turn the power back on. <laughs> Look at that, dead on. That explains why this one was hot because this one's running at 33 milliamps while this one was running at 30. So sure enough, um, I'm gonna leave that one alone. I don't have to touch it. 
So that's it for this uh, procedure. Uh, so part two, I have to get the transistor for these boards and I got to get the bulbs and we can clean it all up and put it back together and we can do one final run. In the meantime, my Discord link is in the description below. Also in the description below is the video on cleaning controls from X-Ray Tony B and polarity of nonpolar capacitors that I mentioned in this video by Mr. Carlson. Anyways, thank you for watching, and if you have a comment, please feel free to leave one. Until next time, guys.